All right, let's begin. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Oppenheim. I am the president of the Medical Alert Monitoring Association. I am also the CEO of Affiliated Monitoring. Uh, we're honored to have you all here with us today. Now, we all know how critical it is of the, the services that we offer. Um, but if there's anything that this year has taught us, it is that our mission to protect the vulnerable is as critical as ever. And uh, unfortunately, our industry is confronted with a technical challenge over the next year that, that every uh, PERS company is going to have to work through. And here at MAMA, we felt it was important for us to um, focus the industry and support the industry. Um, so first, I'd like to welcome, as the, the numbers keep climbing, uh, I I'd like to welcome our current members of the Medical Alert Monitoring Association who support the organization with their dues and sponsorships and allow us to continue our vital programming for the industry, including webinars like this. I'd also like to welcome our first time attendees um, as well as those who learned about this webinar through the PERS Insider email newsletter. Now we decided at MAMA to make this uh, webinar open to everyone, not just membership, because of the importance of the topic. Um, and so we hope that is appreciated by the industry and shows the gravity. Now, um, first, I'd like to just spend a minute on MAMA and remind everyone that, uh, as we know, MAMA, a great acronym, stands for the Medical Alert Monitoring Association, founded in 2008. Um, we are the only trade association dedicated to the medical alert monitoring and PERS industry. Our membership represents the vast majority of PERS industry companies in the United States, as well as those associated vendors and relevant and important stakeholders. Now we focus on the critical issues of our industry, whether that is uh, lobbying federal and state organizations on behalf of the industry, whether that's promoting best practices, encouraging industry norms, as well as creating a unique place for networking and sharing of information. Now, many of you who have joined this um, webinar are members, but if, for those of you considering, if you were to speak to a member, you will know we are proud of our 96% member retention rate. And any member that you speak to will tell you that they have improved their business and then it has helped with personal growth that they've gained through their MAMA uh, membership and attending our conferences. Now, as a reminder, MAMA hosts a conference every year as I said, um, we usually do it in person, usually in the fall. Um, this year, we are planning to host our, our, a conference in Chicago. The dates are September 27th through the 29th. It will be a combined in-person and virtual event. If circumstances make it so that it, it can only be virtual, so be it. But we are fully planning for this to be an in-person event as well. And I look forward to seeing many of you who I have not seen in, a, in over a year at, at the conference. And lastly, I, I'd like to remind everyone um, on the webinar of the annual MAMA Edmonds Group Industry Survey. Uh, believe it or not, we are, we are now entering our fourth year. Um, it has been a very valuable project. It's one of uh, MAMA's capstone initiatives. Um, it is the results are presented every year at the conference. Um, however, it is a survey of all the PERS companies in the United States. It allows for um, tremendous data to be shared, not only with stakeholders, um, but with our lenders and the, the world at large. It's a, it is a confidential survey. Your information that you share with the Edmonds Group is, is not passed to MAMA or anyone else. And for those who have participated, it has given tremendous value to them. Um, and it's an important project for our industry. It allows us to quantify its size and its growth. Um, and um, I encourage those who have not participated or are not aware of it to reach out uh, to me or anyone at MAMA to learn more about it. So on to the topic of the day. Um, today we are hosting a webinar, as I said, open to all on the pressing issue of the forthcoming sunset of the 3G cellular networks by both AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. Um, this is a critical issue, and there is no sign that these dates will be changed. We are now 11 months away, and while many of you are focused on it, um, others have had a very difficult year and are a little behind on this project. So we thought, you know, this is of singular importance, not only for our mission, 
to protect seniors, but also the economic health and well-being of PERS industry businesses. So with that, um, when we thought and conceived of this, who better to um, educate us and speak to us on this than our two panelists who I'd like to introduce now. First, um, we are fortunate uh, to have both of these gentlemen as members of the MAMA board and long time, both of their companies as foundational members of MAMA stretching back um, um, at least to its founding. So first I'd like to introduce Rob Flippo. He is the CEO of Mobile Help. Uh, during the last 16 years, Rob has worked in both startup environments as well as Fortune 50 companies. Um, Rob has experience in forming high performance teams and has held executive roles in high-tech companies such as Motorola, Boca Research, and Emergent Incorporated. He is currently a member of the board of directors of the Medical Alert Monitoring Association. Rob has received both an MBA and undergrad from the University of Miami. I'm sorry, Rob, I apologize. An MBA from the University of Miami and a uh, BS in electrical engineering from the University of South Florida and holds seven US patents. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, and Jason, we have the CEO of, of Mobile Help. Jason is uh, leading the charge. I'm sorry, CEO of VRI. Jason <laughs> is leading the charge. We already have Mobile Help CEO. Uh, Jason is lead, leading the charge at VRI to find and deliver innovative and effective solutions to save lives and preserve independence through remote patient monitoring. Under Jason's leadership, VRI continues to grow and provide both new services um, but improve the overall client experience. Um, prior to becoming uh, VRI CEO, Jason was the president and COO of VRI. Prior to Jason's time at VRI, he was uh, senior vice president at Pacific Pulmonary and was and served as the assistant deputy mayor for the city of Los Angeles. Jason um, has his undergraduate from Notre Dame and an MBA from Stanford. And with that, um, two uh, highly credentialed and experienced veterans of our industry. I turn to you to help um, all of us navigate what I'm sure has been a difficult journey for both of you. Um, I'm gonna start with the easiest question, but probably the hardest. Um, Rob, I'll start with you. Um, why should we be paying attention to this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. First, one comment on your, uh, on your intro about getting together in September, I can tell you, if we're not able to get together in person in September, I'm going to have to kill somebody. So. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, Jason looks like he's standing up and making me feel really lazy. But beyond mm -hmm. that, um, why is it important for, for us to pay attention to this? The, the obvious thing is that as it stands right now in February of next year, which is um, less than a year away, the 3G networks that we all rely on heavily for our equipment is going to be sunset and the equipment that's in the field isn't gonna work anymore. So the, the obvious thing is that the, the, those devices are no longer gonna work, um, which means we've gotta do something about it now. Um, I think that it's important to pay attention to now and we frankly all have, have likely been paying attention to it before this, but it's gonna be a phased approach. So um, unlikely just unlike just flipping a switch and all of a sudden the 3G network's gone, we will all start to see cases where the, the, the providers will start shutting down regions of network, basically by zip code, as they need to reallocate uh, bandwidth um, to, to 5G. Um, so we're gonna start to see, to, for 4G and 5G, we're gonna start to see that, that phasing happen uh, this year assuming it follows the same path that the 2G to 3G migration did, which I fully expect that it will. And then the second real, real thing that's, that's important is inventory management. So as we think about um, swapping out equipment that's, that's uh, 3G today with 4G or, or 5G equipment, inventory management is gonna become a really big driver for decisions, uh, financial um, uh, planning, et cetera. Um, so I think that's the, the two biggest reasons why we need to be paying attention right now. Great. Um, Jason, before I move to you, I, I want to take advantage of uh, Zoom's functionality. I'd like to put up a quick poll for now that we have sort of full attendance. Um, we're going to ask a um, question of everyone involved. We're going to see it right now. 
when did your organization stop shipping 3G devices? Um, we're gonna, everyone can sort of start voting right now on this question. We're gonna leave it up for a few seconds. And while people are voting, um, I encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A in the, in the chat. Um, I will be watching the chat. And once, um, we're just, once Jason, Rob and I are done with our conversation, we will absolutely um, take uh, questions from, from our attendees. So we're gonna leave this up just for uh, another few minutes, another few moments. All right. Share the results with everyone. Inter interesting. Looks like the num the about forty percent of our attendees it was Q two of twenty twenty. All right. So, Jason, I'm going to ask you the same question that uh, that I asked Rob. Yeah, so I mean, I would, I would say one thing, I sort of disagree with your introduction, Daniel, where you say that um, I'm an authority on the 3G to 4G. Most of it's come from conversations with many of the people on this um, conference call and um, this video presentation. So hopefully we're able to present a lot of what we've heard through those dialogues. And um, I'm looking forward to learning more from those on here through the questions you ask, because we keep learning each day. I think Rob did a really nice job capturing a number of the things that are really important. The way that I think about it is it's a big disruption to our business. So just executing the business plan, but forget the business. It's about the grandparents and parents we serve and the, the disruption to them. So they're relying on us to make sure that they can have the safety that they want, that they can live independently, confidently. And so how do we go about and continue to support them aging in place? So aging in their homes. Great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jason. Sorry, guys. Um, now, you know, I think that one of the biggest um, wives' tales, and so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my cards now, um, is that COVID and the last year, the tremendous disruption, um, will lead to the cellular companies um, extending the deadline. And I, I don't know if this is wishful thinking. Um, by those in the industry, um, but I, I would like to sort of pose that question to both of you and and your thoughts, whether you you know have any insights on that. But that there's certainly a it, a, a fervent hope that that somehow COVID might result in um, AT and T pushing its February 2022, which is you know 11 months essentially from now, the deadline. I don't know if either of you want to speak on that. Yeah, Daniel, I think um, I think we've all heard things like that. Probably a lot of the people on this call have heard things like that. And there's some logic to it, right? So if you think about um, our industry, there's a fair segment, fairly large segment of our industry that requires in-home installation in many cases. Um, and the electronic security industry in a broader sense also requires people to go into the homes to change things. So um, the security industry has an even bigger issue than we do in terms of sheer numbers. So it would make logical sense that there could be an argument for, for extending it. I think there's a, a fair amount of lobbying going on to try and make that happen as well. So when I first started hearing those rumors, I thought, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And I could see somebody um, making that change uh, and maybe pushing it out. But everything that I've heard up until recently would suggest actually the opposite. And it's a little counterintuitive. So if you think about the carriers and what, what position they're in. One of the things that the pandemic also created was a situation where a ton of people were working from home and from remote locations and the need for broadband everywhere all of a sudden became a real issue, right? So the, the, the pushing everybody into their homes away from our office where we have broadband access really, really readily available actually created a different problem and that's just general access to broadband. So the carriers are saying, no, we can't push this out because we've got this even bigger problem of generally providing broadband. So I, I would not bet my business on, on them moving the date at all. Um, and everything I've heard up until 
even very recently suggest that they're not they're not going to move the date. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but I certainly wouldn't bank on it. Uh, Jason, um, how do you think about that at VRI? I agree with Rob. So I don't feel that there's any sort of information that's out there that's credible to suggest that we should be optimistic or hopeful that the dates will move. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add to um, both of your sentiments, and that that's my my perception. And and I think that the reality is is we have to operate our businesses with the expectation that that's the deadline. Um, um, and anything that would happen would be a surprise, a, a happy surprise. Uh, that being said, I, I just want to inform because we have many Mama members. The board has been focused on lobbying efforts and has joined forces with the broader life safety industry to push um, at the congressional level for, um, for efforts. So, you know, it's important in life to hold two ideas in your, to be able to hold two ideas at the same time. One being, it's most likely this um, is the deadline and we should not expect it to be extended, but work our damn hardest to see if we can get it. Um, and so for those MAMA members in the industry at large, we have dedicated a lot of resources, both time and money at the MAMA board level to, um, to efforts in concert with the life, broader life safety industry and the alarm industry communications um, committee of which MAMA is a member. And so while our fingers are crossed for success, we are assuming those dates are, are, are firm. Yeah, and Daniel, the other thing I'll add is even if even if they were to be pushed into extending the date, which is what would happen, right? They wouldn't do it because they want to do it. They'd be doing it because they're pushed to do it. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be degradation of service in regions across the country. So even if they're moving it, we're going to be dealing with this um, at yeah. least regionally um, either way. So, so Rob, if, if you could just follow on with that, we got a question from the audience from Robert Bushnell, which is, could, could you just speak a little bit more to that concept of degradation before the actual sunset date? I think there is um, some confusion. Sure, so um, as a manufacturer who's been doing cellular from, from inception, we're one of the few companies that actually lived through the 2G to 3G migration in the PERS industry. Um, and the way it worked, and it's going to be very likely to be the same scenario is that as bandwidth needs to be reallocated, particularly in high density areas is where we saw it happen. Um, they need to take bandwidth, move it from, from 3G to 4G. They will essentially shut down 3G in regional pockets. So you'll get a notification from the carrier that says 30 days from now, we're shutting down the 3G capability in the following zip codes. Then you got to scramble to figure out which customers do you have in those zip codes, quickly get all that qu equipment changed out. And sometimes they don't give you more than 30 days that to, before they mm -hmm. literally shut the switch off in that, in that region. And what happens as we get closer and closer to the actual sunset date, the number of areas where that is, is happening increases. So we had we actually had the first one for 3G in, in December of 19, believe it or not. There was... Uh, several hundred zip codes where they reallocated bandwidth. We had to figure out who, which customers we had there to make sure equipment was going to continue to work. But we fully expect to see that to start ramping up here as we get into 2021. Great. The, the, the one thing I would also I would add though is I do think depending upon the size of your business, um, you could kind of approach this a little bit differently. So I've seen some local companies, like they mobilize really fast and they do a fantastic job swapping out devices. And so I think the level of risk you could be willing to take, depending upon your ability to mobilize individuals to go into a home or get a device, a new device in place, could really kind of change your perspective on maybe taking a little bit of a gamble or waiting to see if something does change. From, from where I sit, and because we provide service across the nation, it's just taking the risk around potentially squeezing out a few more months on a 3G device and someone maybe not having service, it's just too much for us as a monitoring company and what we provide to do to say, um, we're gonna take that, that risk. But I could certainly see some business cases potentially to where you could um, you know, maybe wait a little longer. You know, uh, to, to that uh, point, Jason, you know, I, I, I absolutely appreciate that, that um, 
smaller companies or potentially uh, companies that have more density that aren't spread out in there. Um, there's pluses and minuses. The, the minus being if they're, if they're in the density where they happen to get an early shutdown, it's going to impact all their customers at the same time. But if, they're, if they do have density, but, but along that, you know, I, I do think you know, there is a perception of, of simplicity or that you know, when the time comes, we'll deal with this, um, um, that I think some dealers and, and companies um, possess from the 2G to 3G conversion. Um, wondering, you know, if you want to, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I just, I, I kind of size it this way, saying um, the percentage of devices that we currently have on the cellular network is two and a half times more than when we went through the 2G transition. And all of the industry's grown, so we have just have more individuals out there. And if I just, I, I was looking um, last week, and so far in this year, in 2021, 90% of all devices we've shipped out new devices have been cellular. You think back three years ago, it was less than 25% for us. And so just the magnitude of number of devices, it's really different. I think all of us are facing, whether you're a smaller business or not, you just have more that you're um, thinking about at this time. Um, Rob, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think Jason is a spot on that. It really has more to do with the sheer volume of devices that we're talking about this time versus last time. Um, I think in 20, when we did the 2G migration, we had less than 10,000 total devices that we had to deal with. Um, and now it's uh, orders of magnitude more. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of, of volume of devices and the, and the scale of the conversion, um, in the, I've been reading not only in the trade publications, but you know, not in specific to PERS industry, but also just the Wall Street Journal had a front page article just the other day on the supply chain and the ch general challenges that, that the electronics industry has been suffering. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, Rob, is that something that you are seeing and how um, are you seeing it in, in your business? Jason, are you seeing this in your business and how are you planning around it? Yeah, so I can, I can speak as a manufacturer. So we have sort of a unique pain point here that, that those aren't in the manufacturing arena aren't, aren't seeing. And I'm sure all my brothers and sisters who are in the manufacturing arena have lost uh, plenty of sleep this year or for the last year over this. Um, there have been tremendous issues with supply chain that go all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic. So the when, when COVID first hit, it hit first in China, where a lot of the components are built for, for everything, right? Not just PERS devices, but every kind of electronics you can think of. A lot of, the, a lot of the factories that build those parts are in China. So there were slowdowns that had a ripple effect all the way through the summer. Um, and on top of that, there was an increased demand for electronics. This whole shift of folks to their homes working meant more people needing computers and cameras and every kind of electronic device that you can imagine put even more pressure on, on supply chain for, for those types of products. Um, and as the pandemic spread across the world, those, the, the pressure started to turn to shipping companies. So it wasn't just the raw materials. It was, how do I get a container from China or Malaysia into the U.S. if it has to stop in four ports along the way? All of them are having trouble with longshoremen because COVID restrictions are limiting how many people can work in a confined area. Um, so now all of a sudden a, a shipping container takes two months instead of one month um, to arrive. And then to sort of icing on the cake, there's a, there was a factory in China, not to get too technically wonky, that makes um, crystal oscillators that are required for pretty much every cell phone device in the world. This one manufacturer built 85% of the world supply of a specific part burned down like it had nothing to do with the pandemic it was just a freak um act uh, of nature the, the factory burned down all of the mod module vendors tell it u blocks they all need these same components so um that put even more stress on the on the supply chain at a time when we didn't need it so the long and the short of it is that, that lead times went from six to 12 weeks um, to over 30 weeks in some cases for some of these components. So if you weren't planning over a half a year out, 
you're out of luck. Like you're, 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 you're not going to get, not going to get components. So um, it doesn't look like it's going to resolve itself until probably towards the end of the year, right when everybody's going to be looking for lots of equipment. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a challenging situation yeah. at best. Being, Jason, I would Jason if, if I could just reframe the question, you know, Rob speaking from a manufacturer, you, you are a buyer. So hearing what Rob just said, you know, maybe you could speak to that. How do you think about that? Yeah, so, so we're device agnostic. So we um, work with a number of different manufacturers. I think it's a master plan they all have in place to say that there's going to be supply <laughs> chain constraints so that we all panic and buy a bunch from them. Um, mm-hmm. In all seriousness, it's really important for us to make sure we do have the devices there. There is not a single manufacturer that we work with that hasn't expressed the exact same thing that Rob has said um, around some concerns. And our forecasts say that there is going to be constraints in the second half of the year and what it looks like that that's going to really be the challenge. So I would say a best practice, if you can afford to do it, is I would really think about making sure pulling forward some of that inventory um, into the first half of the year, even if it's being a little conservative, because I don't think any of us want to go through a scenario to where someone wants that new technology and we don't have it for them. Well, at a minimum, let the, let the companies that you do business with know what your needs are so that they can plan them because planning and forecasting is everything. If we can get the, if we can get the forecast in place, we're much more likely to be able to produce equipment at that level. What Spoken what as a manufacturer. Yeah, what'll, what'll be the problem is everybody will decide to order everything in Q4 and it, it just won't happen. Like you right. just can't. And, and, and I'll just add... Um, my, my, my thinking, which is, you know, unlike there's a lot of people suffering with this supply chain um, challenges right now. And for most of those businesses, that just means they're not going to be able to sell. They may not have products to sell. And so they'll have a bad month or a bad couple of months for us uh, in our industry. If we don't have the product in February of 2022 comes, it means that you have customers that you cannot swap that, that are going to be without a system and you have no solution for. Um, it's a much, it's a, it's a higher risk issue, both from the mission, but both from our mission, but also just from the ris- risks of the business. Um, Dan, ahead, one, of the questions, one of the questions I see that was raised was regarding device disposal. I know we were going to touch on that a little earlier, but it sort of makes some sense maybe with sure. the, the supply chain kind of talking about that. So um, we've taken a number of approaches for it and I'll just share, they seem to be received pretty well from our clients. Um, but we do think that, you know, it's our responsibility to try to figure out how to properly address or inform the clients around it. So if they wanna ship it back to us, we pay for them to ship it back to us. We give them the packaging, we'll take it back, we'll dispose of it. But we also have gone through, there's kind of three prongs. So that's the first one, we'll take it back. The other one is providing a really robust list of national companies that do do recycling. So it could be easier for them to dispose of it that way. So that's kind of your um, staples, Office Depots, Walmarts, et cetera. So providing that list and having them understand it. And the third piece is we emphasize throwing it in your trash can or putting it in your recycle bin is not the proper way to dispose of it. And so that's kind of been our approach to it. And um, so far it's been received well. And to give a general sense, um, we've transitioned just over 35% of our clients already from 3G to 4G. And we've done that um, with different, what I call pilots to initially start in 2020 so we could learn. And so that's been so far our best approach. Um, but if others have um, good suggestions, please put them in the comments because we would be um, more than willing to pass those on to this group. Yeah, I, on that note, I'm gonna put up another poll around um, the swap, if everyone could see that. When do you plan to start proactively swapping 3G equipment? Everyone can sort of jump on that now. You know, while we wait for the poll, you know, Jason, you mentioned uh, being conservative and and um, building inventory that has you know real economic burdens or impact to your business. Um, as, you know, as you think about not just supply chain but the realities of the swap. You know, how are you managing the financial impact on VRI? Yeah, so we think of it in three in three kind of big buckets is what I'd say. One is churn, but um, not kind of the churn we just have in our business, but 
churn that is created because we reached out to a client, grandpa and grandma, and asked them to um, accept the new technology. And then for some reason, it's been varying saying, I don't use it enough or that concerns me and they don't want it. So that churn we think about and how that could layer through the business. The other one, just the sheer CapEx, you got to buy devices. And so that adds up fast for all of us, regardless of the size of our business. And then the last piece is workforce. And workforce is, I have a team that's 100% dedicated for all of 2021 and for a large portion of 2020 to transitioning out devices. And that workforce is split down to individuals, um, installers. So those of us that are in the um, healthcare industry for state Medicaid and managed Medicaid typically require someone to go in the home to do any side of in, any side any type of servicing. And so there is some cost associated with that. So, you know, that's been something that we've forecasted very, you know, in our 2020 budget, it started. And so communicating through to our lenders and being very clear around what that impact will be. Um, and so we've been planning for it essentially. But for us, it's really about that, that churn um, number of what it kind of um, causes or leads to. Thank you. Um, Rob, before um, I move to you, I'm going to share the results. Um, good news. I think those who were interested also that um, most have already started and, um, and the rest um, plan, you know, the few others plan to start. I will give a little bit of, of yeah. um, some numbers on the churn. So we said we'd done about 35% of our um, swaps. And so we measure the churn of individuals we've actually proactively reached out to and what has it led to. And so if you measure churn all in, it's 1% of the individuals we've talked to, but that includes individuals we reached out to and we got there ahead of time of finding out that unfortunately maybe they passed away. And so that would have been churn regardless. So mm -hmm. if you strip that out, it's 10 basis points. It's been 0.1% of it. Wow. But so we've kind of got there a little bit earlier on some of the other churn because we haven't received the communication from either the family or the case manager. So that's been our experience so far um, through kind of a little over a third of our transition. Great. Yeah. Uh, Rob, anything on that topic? On the, uh, on the churn or the? The larger uh, planning and financial planning piece of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the the, the broad message is the the earlier you plan, the better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If you started this last year, you're probably in a better shape than you were um, if you started this year. Um, so I think I think that we always sort of looked at timing being a, an important aspect of how we plan through this. Um, so when we think about best practices in terms of how we want to implement um, a program around this. I, I kind of look at it in, in terms of letting churn be our friend. So we're in a relatively high churn industry um, anyways. So if we start early, we can let natural churn take care of a, fair, a fairly large um, portion of the, of the uh, problem. Um, that required that you stop shipping 3G equipment sooner, right? So if you wanted churn to take care of most of the problem, you had to stop shipping 3G equipment sooner in the process. Um, so we kind of took, took that position to some extent. But then in terms of engagement, you think about what, what Jason was talking about. The, we all know as industry participants that the more directly we engage our patients the more, or, or customers, the more likely we are to create churn for a whole bunch of different reasons, right? So generally, a, a, a more hands-off approach reduces churn. Um, one of the things that we've done that's been very successful is used inbound requests for technical service, customer support, literally any customer facing issue that somebody could be calling you for, whether it's a billing issue or a technical issue, recognize that that person's on a 3G system and use that outreach from them as an opportunity to, to, to let them know, hey, it's your lucky day, we're going to upgrade you to the latest and greatest equipment. Um, and these are customers who are already trying to continue to be customers, right? So they weren't, they were trying to stay engaged and, and customers. We've actually seen no impact to churn by utilizing that as a, as a method for, for um, transitioning customers. And not surprising, the, the 3G equipment and customers are some of our oldest customers anyway. So they have a higher likelihood of calling for one of those reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe that we're going to be able to take care of a huge portion of the transition 
strictly on inbound on inbound calls. And then when we get to the point where we actually have to reach out to people, we need to be really smart about it, right? We need to think about what those customers look like, how long have they been customers, what have our interactions been with them, and try to be a little more analytical about how we go about dealing with that group. Great. Um, Jason, I, I'd love to just swing from Rob's. Um, I know you run a tight operation. If maybe you can speak about how you guys are thinking internally on staffing and, and running through um, the communication and, and swap plan. Yeah, so I'll build a little bit on what Rob's saying and talk a little bit about kind of our approach. Um, we look at our clients, we kind of look at the six month mark from an engagement perspective. So if in the past six months, they've had a button press, we, we view them as engaged. If it's been longer than six months, we view them as not engaged. And we know from the programs that we put in place that that seems to be the magic point at which if anyone's been engaged with us in the prior six months, it's a pretty easy conversation. They want the device, they're gonna swap it out. If it's been longer than six months, we typically have something that's not working in the sense of maybe we have the wrong phone number, we have the wrong address. There's something has changed. And so how do we re-engage them? And so when it comes to communication for us, we think about how do we re-engage those over six months um, primarily. And um, our focus are 75% of everyone we go after right now, because every month we have goals in place, are people that, to Rob's point, they've in, they're inbounding somewhere in the organization, or we've had some sort of recent interaction with them. 25% are these ones over six months, because we don't want to wait till the end to go after the hardest um, individuals and try to re-engage them. And so for us, there's kind of, it's two pronged. One is you got to connect the dots. So you have to start with your own profile of that, of that client. You have to know what language is their primary language. You have to know what device they have. And are they going to get a similar device? Is it going to look different? Is it going to be the same to set expectations? You have to know if you're getting paid for them. So for in healthcare, do you have an authorization? That's good. If you aren't getting paid for them and you're never going to get paid for them, it's probably not someone you want to go after. Private pay individuals, obviously, are they paying their bill? And so we think around a lot of those pieces. So you start internally, build the profile. And then the last one is you have to have a lot of options for them to communicate with you. And no, there's no one magic bullet, but there's some really interesting information around most of our individuals. So we start, we send out postcards. We have a website set up that people can go and put their information and say, I want the new device. That is tremendously popular. The most the time of the day that someone goes to that, it's always after 10 p.m. That's when we get most of the interactions. So they go wow. in there and do that. And so we're so that's an option. So we do the postcards. We do out IVR saying new technology on behalf of your health plan. We do live phone calls. And then we capture anything coming in anywhere within the business. So if you're calling technical support, customer care, um, the billing department, and they're seeing the 3G flashing on the screen, then we have a team that goes through it. So that's important piece there of communicating external, but we have two other communication pieces that are important as well. So we have VRI team members. We have to communicate to them. They have to know what 3G, 4G is. They have to be educated. They have to be able to have compelling conversations. They have to be able to have effective conversations. And so we've been doing modules every month for almost a year now where we educate individuals about the 3G, 4G and build on those conversations. And then we also provide monitoring for other partners. And so going through and making sure we understand their business plan of when they're gonna start um, doing the transition and how can we support them. And it's also providing kind of web information to them as well that they can go get um, has been important as well. So it, there's a lot, but it's, you have to have all of it. Right. And, and that seems to be the theme both from Rob and you, Jason, that that the reality is um, that this is a multi-pronged approach and 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 a journey, right? Um, there was a request in um, Jason not to put you on the spot, but if you could share um, how you created those list of recycling centers, we can or we can distribute it after, or, or if there was a resource online. Yeah, I, I could I could list them all probably. Yeah. I may miss one or two of them, but what I what we could do is to the attendees, I'm more than yeah. happy to make sure you get the list because we did do um, a lot of um, research on it. And then I'll actually add some comments around some others we didn't put on there that we've learned since then. Yeah. That would be great. Um, Daniel, one, uh, of the, one of the questions that I saw posed was, and, and it's related to what we were just talking about, do you, do you expect churn to go up um, I was during this. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and the short answer is yes. Like there's, there's, there's really no way to do this entirely without increasing churns, which is why we have to be 
as careful and thoughtful about it as we can. We do have some interesting data points though, because we've we've been able to compare so the worst case scenario is you're given a group of customers that are gonna go dark in a short period of time, which is what I was describing on the 2G to 3G migration, where you have to literally reach out to them in a very proactive kind of abrupt way, not the best customer experience, but you had to, we had to do it that way because of the short time frame. We saw churn go up by over two percentage points, sort of monthly churn wow. in the case where you were having to directly and aggressively reach out. Um, so that's kind of one boundary point, one boundary condition. I think that's kind of worst case scenario. Um, and then everything we can do to, to get, to get it closer to our typical churn numbers is, is what we're really striving for, but it'll be somewhere in there. And it's most, it's likely that as we get to the very end of the cycle and we have to get more aggressive about reaching out, it'll be higher at the, mm -hmm. sort of at the end of the process. Our, our 2021 budget has our churn going up because of 3G to 4G transition, right? Yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's a small amount, but we budgeted for anticipating that there's going to be some individuals that we can't find or that choose not to have the new technology. And, you know, Ken Gross is trying to put us on the, on the spot here saying, what are you going to do just... when you don't activate? And so um, what I keep telling the team internally is do not put me in the position of having to answer that question. And so what that means is we intentionally have our timeline set for months earlier than when it actually gets turned off the network. So that gives us time then to figure out what to do with that bucket. But our entire focus is how do we make that bucket as small as possible through continuing to optimize kind of the different communication methodologies we have. So I don't have a perfect answer then. I hope I'm not faced with figuring that one out because we've done such a good job transitioning and reaching out and tire, tirelessly trying to reiterate the value of what we add, what our business adds. Ken, that's a non-answer answer, officially. <laughs> only, only an attorney would recognize well, did, that, right? Didn't, didn't you say Jason was like the deputy assistant mayor somewhere? Exactly I right. I just saw that's that. exactly right. Yeah, there's a new show on television, I think, about the Los Angeles mayor. Um, um, Rob, is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, I think that one of the things that makes this, um, makes Mama great is we're always talking about best practices. Is there anything around um, this process that, that you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about some of what we're doing best practice wise and, and all I can just tell everybody is uh, plan, as, plan as far ahead as you can. Um, spreading this out over time is, is gonna help, help all of us, help you, help you in, the, in the business. Um, so forecasting the impacts are important. It's, it's interesting. We've been thinking about this for a while. Again, as a manufacturer, we're looking a couple of years down the road um, and building in costs and, and CapEx into the models years ahead of time and having now, now actually seeing it happen is it's, it's just as painful as when we were building the models in the first place is all I can say. Yeah. I, I, um, I, go ahead. I, I would say you, you, have to tr you have to start doing something because you learn. And there's just little things you learn that are really fascinating. So in one of our scenarios, we were asking people to test their devices. Well, as many of you know, some of the new devices, Rob, yours is one of them, that if they test it, it actually gets automatically taken care of. It doesn't go to any agents. They don't see that. So we're asking them to test their device with the idea that when they test it, we're talking to them around the new technology, yet we're never talking to them with how it's set up. And so there's things like that you need to learn as you're going through it. So you adjust and you learn and you keep moving forward. Um, but I would definitely start um, earlier. Great. Any, any other questions from the, before we continue, any other questions from our attendees? If they wanna use the Q and A. Um, while we wait, I'm going to go in with um, another, oh, um, another poll that I'm sharing. Um, what percentage of your current cellular devices are 3G? Sort of speaks to something, Jason, that you raised earlier. While we wait, um, I just wanna remind everyone that 
that MAMA's next big initiative is launching the uh, annual survey of PERS industry, the confidential survey um, that MAMA runs every year um, and has hired uh, the Edmonds Group to run for us. Um, we are starting it earlier this year with the hopes of, of, of closing it um, at the beginning of the summer and using it to um, build more interesting data and glean um, more insights. So for those of you, um, and I see many names on the list who participate, you will be hearing um, from the Edmonds group earlier than usual and um, with a couple of additional questions. And the, you know, it is, as many of you know, it's been an invaluable benefit to growing the um, investor base and lending base um, in our industry. And so I'm gonna close this poll now and share the results. And as we'd expect, um, I, I think one of the things we haven't um, mentioned, but is a, something we've learned is, you know, digital landlines are very great, are great units. You don't have to worry about swapping them out. And so we have revisited it as we go through this, if it's appropriate for the grandpa in grandpa and grandma's lifestyle, if does a digital landline unit make sense for them? And that could be an option too, as far as if there are inventory constraints or anything of that nature down the road, there could be a way that you could service still your clients through kind of using that technology as well. Um, yes, right. And we certainly, I'm certainly, I'm sure all have them on the shelves and available. Um, there's a question from Alan Penn. Um, did either of you consider charging your customers for the upgrade and what, what did you ultimately decide to do? It was Mine's a really easy answer. I'm in healthcare, so I don't, I don't have the option to charge them for the upgrade. It's part of the service. So, um, so I, I didn't, I don't have that yeah. flexibility. Yeah. In our, in our direct to consumer business, we considered it. Um, and we actually came close to piloting it, but ultimately decided that it was likely going to create a churn profile that we weren't going to be happy with. So we, we decided not to do that. Right. I think it's a something for, depending upon the nature of your business and the size of your business, you might want to consider, but um, it's very risky. Ultimately, preserving the recurring revenue is, is, is priority. And this represents, it's also... Um, it represents a lot of delay in the process, especially now. Um, Jason, Rob, thank you very much. We're, we're, we're pulling up at um, 50 minutes. Um, I want to be respectful to our attendees' time and to your time. Um, if there's any closing thoughts um, before we wrap this up. I think that Mama should start to plan the post 3G, 4G migration party now. Um, there's got to be some event in Las Vegas after the, after the transition happens that we can all get together and, and, and celebrate that this is behind us. Um, and hopefully we don't have to talk about this for a while. I know the right. 4G um, transition out in 2028 that's already being sort of grumbled about. Um, since it's the same technology platform, we may actually not have to go through this again, which is what I'm hopeful for. But um, uh, we're all in this together. So um, if we can help you in any way, um, we're, we're here to try and help. Yeah, I don't Great. think Rob could have said it any better. It's, we're all in it together. So any ideas, any best practices, um, please share them with me. And I'd be happy to kind of share our experiences if we've had them trying different um, options to get these devices swapped out. Great. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, as, as some people know, participating in a webinar isn't just showing up, it's preparation and planning in advance. So thank you both. Thank you for your participation on the MAMA board and to the entire MAMA board. And of course, thank you to all MAMA members and sponsors who continue to sponsor us, allow us to represent the industry um, and uh, conduct programming like this. And of course, our annual conference in September in Chicago. I look forward to seeing many of you there. Um, so thank you again. And this, uh, we will make this available uh, via recording on the MAMA website for MAMA members. Um, but as of course, thank you. Welcome to guests and uh, both, both guests of MAMA and a uh, PERS Insider who joined 
Um, and I uh, hope this was valuable and makes you consider uh, joining MAMA. All right, everyone have a great day. Rob, Jason, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.